This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Phoenix and Lotus. Phoenix and Lotus is a shop that specializes in high-quality, independently produced tarot and oracle decks. Many of these decks are rare and unique, so you won't find them in most places, and all of them are beautifully crafted. You can shop Phoenix and Lotus online at phoenix-lotus.com, and if you use coupon code WITCH, you'll get 10% off your first order. So check out the Divination Decks on Phoenix and Lotus today. Today's episode is supported by Health Witch. Health Witch is the creator of HW Apothecary, which offers potions inspired by earthly queens, witches, and heavenly goddesses. HW Apothecary is adored for such products as their Rejuvenation Oil, which is made with over 660 roses, and their Spiced Tea, which is made with real pearls. To purchase these and more, go to healthwitch.org, and Witchwave listeners get an extra 20% off HW Apothecary sales with code WITCHWAVE, all one word, now through May 31st. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello, and welcome to The Witch Wave. I have a confession. I'm a bit late in putting this episode together because I have spent hours upon hours upon hours watching the red carpet of the Met Gala. As some of you know, this year's theme is camp. So the fashion is all about exaggeration and humor and irreverence and what I like to call demented joy. It's about marrying the high and the low and taking delight in poking fun at notions of artifice and illusion. It's theatrical, it's over the top, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. And I think we could all use a little bit of that spirit right now. I know I certainly can. Some people might think that fashion is frivolous in general, and that this campy style of fashion is the most frivolous of all. And they might also believe that focusing on fashion and fancy parties right now is in terrible taste when we have so many serious things to worry about, like climate change and human rights violations and a very, very shaky democracy. And I get it. But I would argue that engaging in innovation, art, And joy can not only be an act of resistance in itself, but is in fact necessary to sustain us and keep our morale boosted so we can keep fighting the important fights. And that's the key, of course, to splash around in replenishing waters of pleasure, but not get so driven to distraction that we never get back to the important tasks at hand. Sometimes that which seems silly on its surface can also be a source of great teachings. Tonight, as I watched people wearing outfits that break rules of so-called good taste and propriety, I was reminded of the ways in which some of my most meaningful magic has come from unlikely, unconventional, or allegedly unrefined sources. 
my spirituality has been influenced by alchemical texts and tomes of so-called traditional rituals, but also from comic books and 90s rock musicians and children's cartoons. Yes, you can have tea with the demon Mara, as Buddhists suggest, in order to soothe your anxieties. Or you can look the fear demon Gaknar in the eyes and stump him to death, like Buffy did, once she realized he was actually quite minuscule and just really mouthy. This attitude of getting magical inspiration from anywhere, the high and the low, is one that today's guest, Maya Spalter, shares with me. As a writer about witchcraft and an employee of one of New York City's most established witch shops, she's developed her own style of magic making that's equal parts organized and improvised, and that incorporates plenty of pop culture and cosmic jokes. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Wishes. Brandon writes, Hi Pam, I've been practicing my craft for nearly five years now. However, about 10 months ago, I started a new full-time job that is incredibly demanding and involves a three-hour commute daily. I'm finding it's difficult for me to feel connected to my practice, and it's almost stressful for me to think about making extra time in my already packed days. The flow of energy that I feel needs to be present in my craft is just few and far between. I know that you also have experience as a working witch, and I'm wondering if you have any tips to keep the energy flowing and to just add some ritual into day-to-day craziness. Hi, Brandon. Yes, indeed, I have gone through times of feeling just like that myself, and I know there are plenty of other listeners who can relate to. So in keeping with the theme of this show, I'm going to challenge you to think about how you can combine your devotion with fun and joy. Because yes, ritual or spellcraft can sometimes be demanding and take lots of focus and energy, absolutely. But if what you're looking for right now is to just feel connected in your day to day, it needs to feel less like work and more like play. It's pretty much the same advice people are given about exercise, that you won't start it and you certainly won't keep it up if it just feels grueling. So you need to figure out a routine that you get some enjoyment out of. As my guest Maya Spalter and I talk about later in this episode, one really great access point for magic is music. You have a long commute, but I wonder if you're able to listen to music on your headphones if you're taking public transportation, or in your car if you're driving. And if so, I suggest you make yourself a magical mix of some songs that elevate your spirit. My coven and I recently started a shared playlist of songs that help us tap into self-love and put us in touch with divine, swaggering goddess energy. And it's not just chanting and drones and ohms. It's songs by artists like Missy Elliott and Bikini Kill and Grace Jones. So that's my first recommendation, to make yourself a magical mix. And my second is to figure out ways that you can infuse your day job with magic. I worked out of a cubicle for many years, but I had a small collection of precious objects like gemstones and a tiny figure of Artemis that I kept on my desk. And I would buy myself a bouquet of flowers on the pagan holy days or wear certain talismans or other intentional jewelry or colors whenever I needed to. And even though I worked in a relatively creative department, it was still a corporation, so I did keep things a little bit subtle. But if you don't feel comfortable having these types of objects or symbols out in the open at all, maybe you can at least have them in a little box or keep them in a drawer 
so you can open it and check in with them whenever you need a little extra boost. But whatever you end up doing, make sure you do it in the spirit of joy and delight. As Doreen Valiente's Charge of the Goddess famously says, All acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. So Brandon, I wish you ease, play, love, and pleasure as you figure out new ways to incorporate magic into your workday. Now, on to my guest. Maya Spalter is the author of Enchantments, a modern witch's guide to self-possession, which is honestly one of my favorite witchcraft how-to books. Maya is a longtime employee of New York City's oldest occult shop, which is also called Enchantments, where she's worked on and off since the year 2000. In addition to that, she writes poems and stories about science and mystery, and she infuses everything she does with wit, heart, and smarts. On this episode, Maya and I discuss what it's like to be a professional witch in a retail environment, the importance of pop a culture, and ways to make magic with whatever you have at hand. And as you'll hear, one of my cats, Albi, took a very particular interest in Maya, and he joins our conversation from time to time. Maya joined me and my cats here in person at my Brooklyn apartment. Maya Spalter, welcome to The Witch Wave. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. You are the author of Enchantments, a modern witch's guide to self-possession. And by way of introduction, the name of that book is also the name of a legendary New York City witch shop that I know you still work at. So why don't we start there? How did you come to work at Enchantments? I started working at Enchantments when I was about 19 years old. I was in my second year at college, and I went wandering around the East Village looking for a job. I went into every store, and yeah, I walked into Enchantments, and they're just like, "Well, you're hired." And I said, "Great! Like, what do we what do we do? <laughs> what do we do here?" <laughs> did you have any interest in witchcraft? At I that did. Point? I certainly did. I had frequented the nearest. I guess they used to call it like a head shop. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe the first one I went to was in like New Hope, Pennsylvania, when I was like <gasps> seven. New Hope is one of my like sacred spaces. Have you been to the head shop? Yes, yeah. I've been to the head shop. I mean, this is back in the 90s when I was hanging out there. Yeah, but, me too. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, that's where you get your Jimi Hendrix posters mm -hmm. and your patchouli incense. Do you remember Zipperhead, the record shop? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I definitely do. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So funny. Yeah, no, I'd always been a witchy kid. I just, I didn't realize where I was. I opened the door. I said, do you need someone to help here? And then I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I can get done with this. How excellent. Yeah. So they immediately hired you on the spot? Yeah, which is, I've never seen that happened since I think there had just been a bit of a purge and they're like well lucky you <laughs> we right need people. place right time stars aligning yeah so how long did you work there I worked there for almost five years but everything I did then was I guess sort of sporadic I was a student every summer every school break every mm -hmm. whatever it's a retail job it's very flexible <laughs> yeah and you work there again now is yeah, that correct I currently work there in a similarly flexible way. I'm, I'm there one day a week. It's wonderful. I have this craft that I've learned there of carving and dressing candles in this very particular way. And not doing it for years was a little sad for my my hands. They really want to do it. Wow. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and Enchantments is known not just for candles, but also beautiful homemade incense. I've bought so many incense powders from Enchantments. I mean, it's a really, really wonderful shop. But I've always been curious, what is it like to work in the capacity as like a service magician? You're essentially being paid to be a therapist meets 
craftsperson meets, you know, many, many other hats that I know you're wearing. What's an average day like for you there? In terms of an average day, there aren't super average days. There are a few types of days that go sort of cyclically. Lunar events tend to bring on much different uh, type of day than um, just kind of your cold weather Wednesday. But yeah, an average day, let's see, usually we're supposed to open at one and we tell people we open at one ish. So usually we'll arrive at the shop and there's one or two people looking a little bit worried, standing around the sidewalk, looking at their phone. (laughs) We're not going to open on time. We're just not going to be here on time. Like it's not a good idea to come here early. We're never going to be early. We open up the shop. I mean, everything that can be a ritual is a ritual in that space. So we have our little things that we do, lighting the altars, Mm -hmm. feeding the cats, doing the more mundane shop opening things. And then, yeah, we have a few different modes. We weigh things, we carve things, we blend and pour oils. And mostly we just chat with people about what's going on in their lives. And we have a bit of a system for that that sort of organizes what could be a very amorphous conversation into um, interacting with the menu and a system so that we can take what might be messy and sort of lay a little grid over it Mm -hmm. and then tease things apart. Sure, because I imagine people come to you guys wanting all kinds of advice and guidance. I imagine that you hear lots of long stories and people are confessing emotions and desires to you all day long. So sure, you would need some kind of a process to be able to not only know how to get that person what they need, but I imagine also not spend three hours with every person too. Exactly. Yeah. Cause that's, that's just not possible. So this is sort of seems like a derogatory term, but in a lot of magic, as opposed to witchcraft, like cold reading is kind of a part of that. And people tend to use that term to describe like the negative parts of how people can gain your confidence. I've heard that a lot in terms of psychics and how they work, that a psychic will do a cold reading where they try to very quickly assume things about you so they can give you, you know, sometimes to your point, people use this in a derogatory way, like you think it's a real reading, but really they're just inferring things from you. Right. I don't think there is such a hard line. I think like a lot of the things that come across as psychic are just thoughtful uses of the senses you we all have. Intuition. Um, Yeah. Being attentive. I don't know. I don't think there's anything negative about being attentive and taking information from the little things that you notice about people and also paying close attention to the language that people use when they describe their issues and what they're looking for. So that's one of the ways that we can get through a little faster when somebody Mm -hmm. says things about being all unclear, this is tangled, blah, blah, blah. Then it, it cues us, oh, okay, if you feel, if you say tangled, you probably want uncrossing. Yeah. You write about that in your book, the idea that if someone comes to you and they have like four different issues or desires, or they're not super clear about it, that you guys almost always lead them to uncrossing candles or uncrossing incense. Can you talk a little about why and what that means? Yeah. Uncrossing goes by a lot of names. That's the one that we use most readily there. But uncrossing, unhexing, unjinxing, the idea is that you take a knot and untie it. You take a tangled situation and make it clear. So generally, the way that we sort of angle ourselves at enchantments is that eventually you might get to a point that all you want to do are on crossings because you have the sense that you are on your path always, even when it doesn't look that way to you. And that when it's time to do a spell, all you need to really do in your spell is say, take what I don't need from me so that what I do need has enough room, a clear path to get there. So you never do the, I want to get a job spell, or you don't necessarily do the money spell because it's another way. It's like some yogis practice all of the poses and eventually they're like, no, I just practice Shavasana now. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's my pose. So uncrossing is never really a bad idea. Yeah. What are some of the most common desires or intentions or I guess spells that people request from you guys when they're coming into the shop? All the desires are common, I guess. People are like, this is going to sound really strange. And uh, it almost never sounds really strange. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say more people are vocally requesting clarity Mm -hmm. in situations than they used to. They would just display 
signs of being unclear. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. So maybe people are getting more self-aware over oh, the yeah, years. Yeah, I think, I think so. And also people have a little bit more of an idea of like how to approach things holistically. There are more people modeling that way of living now that yeah. it seems like, oh, wow, clarity would be a good idea. How <laughs> interesting. Are people still coming to you for love spells, oh, sex spells, oh, money spells? constantly. People come for love. Absolutely. We explain a lot that the spells are really tricky. <laughs> They're not that like um, one couldn't do a really sort of transactive love spell where it's like, I want this and I get this. It's just when we have a conversation about them, we usually have a conversation about directing your love magic towards yourself. Make it, being receptive is the spell rather than... Um, hunting it down. Yeah, hunting and fishing and stuff. We like to warn people away from that. I guess if I have any message when I'm talking to people about love spells, it's just like, you think you know, but maybe you don't know. And mm -hmm. with sex magic, it's a lot different. If you want to go out there and find somebody to have sex with, like, you can. Here's the tools. Yeah. Have a good time. Yeah. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. Not, um, it was one of my first jobs ever. So I brought that skill and experience of just being like, hello, it's nice to meet you. Tell me what you need and desire in your love soul. Goodbye. That's one of my <laughs> first experiences of like interacting with the public in a service capacity. So it doesn't really compare to many other jobs. Exactly. Um, Are there unusual requests that you remember? We just can't really have our jaws drop in there. <laughs> it's not that we're resistant to it. It's just that like you go in and you're like, well, everybody's potentially going to do or say something very strange and it just has to wash over. I don't tend to latch onto those. I mean, people come in and behave in very, very, very strange ways. So yes, the strangest ones are the things that like I wasn't registering the words they were saying. I was like, okay, I guess I have to find a safe way to remove this person from this space. Right. So their energy was yeah. just like, so like unhealthy. It gets really, really strange. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to those, it's like, I have a serious situation to do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Taking a step back from the most extreme, like safety issues or issues where you might need to get someone some help or call the police or something. Mm -hmm. Just talking about your everyday energy drain you're absorbing, I imagine, a lot of people's energy, a lot of people's desires, a lot of people's attention. How do you keep yourself protected and clear? How do you let go of that after a day working at Enchantments? And how do you prepare yourself, you know, on the flip side to go in? Yeah. Well, it's very helpful for me that I don't have to do it every day. I think it would mm -hmm. be much more challenging. But I do a meditation practice on the subway that is it sounds really simple to me when I describe it and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I'm putting words to this. But it's just sort of like a body scan. I think about different energy points. I try to root my feet into the ground. I try to um, just get a sense of the boundaries of my physical body and then the boundaries of sort of an energetic body around me. I like to will the energetic body around me into existence by imagining it. And um, it's very convenient to do on the subway because... I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing it for. I envision a protective space around myself on the way in, and I never stopped doing it after the first time I realized how very helpful it was. Mm. And when I'm really, truly challenged, when it does become extreme and I do have to bounce someone from the store, mm -hmm. I'm very ready to mm -hmm. do it. And I, it's been really rewarding to know that um, practice really builds strength in those departments. Yes. But also everybody who works there has to have their own limits and their own ways of moving a conversation along. You have to sort of be your own conveyor belt mm -hmm. and know how much to engage mm -hmm. another person in there. And it's not a judgment on that person so much. It's just like, I know I'm not the one who has it today, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to. And, um, it's different for everyone and everybody has their own process in terms of how long you've been working there, you know, how many days you've gone home super drained versus the days where you had firm boundaries with people. And I think some people experience our boundaries in there as a strange 
retail attitude to hold, but because you're not just the customer is always right. No, like you have to set firm boundaries yeah. in that space. I imagine it's a, especially in that space. We're telling the customer that they're wrong, like really often. In, I mean, not that they're context? wrong, but just we just have to reframe things constantly because they're not walking in with necessarily a knowledge of the systems that we're working with. And if somebody comes in with a problem, I can decide if it seems appropriate, like, okay, let's, let's work with planetary energies to deal with this problem. So let's lay this grid over your curvy sort of problem. We can lay the grid of some system over it to help clarify things and to help address it. So again, like it's, it's not that it's arbitrary, but whatever system you choose is not so important. Can we talk specifics? Like, are you saying that someone might come in and they might say, oh, I'm 100% sure I need fire magic. And you would say, actually, have you considered salt? I mean, what do you mean when you say reframing? Right. So sometimes let's say someone came in and they were concerned about money and they say, hey, I want a money candle. But maybe we say, oh, okay, Maybe we talk about it a little bit more and it turns out that the reason that they're worried about money is because their business isn't doing well. Their business isn't doing well because they're fighting with their brother and it's a family business or something like that. And it's like, okay, actually, let's maybe work on healing this relationship and also let's work on like drawing some attention to your business and wow, we have a whole bunch of options of how to do that. So we apply a system just based on a guess. So let's say we want to deal with those things in terms of planetary energies. You want to expand your business. You might do something that has to do with Jupiter. You want to heal a relationship. Then you might do something that has to do with Venus. If you want to have more lucrative cash flow and I guess have more people learn about your business, then you might do something with Mercury. That's not a money candle. Yeah. I'm not going to argue with anyone. If somebody wanted a money candle because that made sense to them, that would be what worked. But the point is finding a logic and then following through with it. Yeah. One of the things I love about your book, Enchantments, is that you really give people the tools for doing this magic themselves. Certainly anybody can and perhaps should go to Enchantments and get to talk to you or whatever witch is working that day. But a lot of folks don't live in New York City and they might not even live near a witch shop or New Age shop or Botanica at all. And now they can read your book and go to the grocery store or their, you know, equivalent of whatever their bodega is or their dollar store mm -hmm. and have really great fundamental tools and directions for starting to make their own magic. Why did you decide to write Enchantments, the book, in the first place? Was that one of the intentions? Absolutely. There are a lot of years when I wasn't working in Enchantments and I also wasn't shopping there, not because I decided not to, but it just wasn't what I was up to at the moment. And I managed to maintain a magical practice just because one of the most important magical principles to me is, is scrappiness. And also what you need isn't far away from you. That's the faith that I have. I think about it in terms of like food a lot, that like an acai berry, if my body really needed an acai berry, it would probably be because I grew where they grow. I think that's how nature works. And also I think that's how our, whatever this is that we live in that, you know, people don't necessarily call nature. I want to treat it that way so that I can feel at peace and whole and a part of my environment, even though the naturalness of my environment is very questionable. Um, <laughs> you have this great line in the book to quote you to you. You say, the most useful magical tools are the ones you can get your hands on, <laughs> which yeah. is super pragmatic. And to what I think you're saying is we're surrounded by enough all the time. You don't necessarily have to source some rare ingredient or, you know, track down this super special rare tool. Like if you want to, great, but you have what you need already. Is that right? 
<laughs> we're notorious down sellers at enchantments just because we were like, well, what do I need? Like, do I need the seven day? Like what's more powerful? And we're like, well, if you're powerful, then you could use this 60 cent candle mm-hmm. and it could be any color in the world. But if you really want to have this like seven day giant green one, cause that's what helps you focus and have a ball. I don't want it to be impossible. That's the whole point. <laughs> like I want doing magic and, and living magically to be accessible. I hate the idea that people long for it and feel like it's out of their reach. I think that's so sad because that's what's so joyful to me about it is that it's like, no, I had this when I was four and I was playing pretend. It's that feeling isn't any different. I love that. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. I want to tell you about Hag Swag, a monthly subscription box geared towards weirdos, witches, hags, and other alternative folk. Once subscribed to Hag Swag, you will receive a variety of curated items right to your door, including occult and pagan inspired products, burnables like incense or cleansing bundles, crystals, accessories, self care items, and more. Each month's theme has information and magical objects that are useful for both new and experienced witchy individuals and flow with the wheel of the year. Some Hagswag box themes have included ritual, divination, origins, and astral magic, helping practitioners expand their existing knowledge and build their collection of tools and offerings. Containing only cruelty-free, vegan, and gender-neutral items, Hag Swag Boxes are suitable for hags of all walks of life. And if you use code WITCHWAVE on their website, www.hagswag.ca, you'll get 5% off your first box. So go to hagswag.ca and use code WITCHWAVE for 5% off your first Hag Swag box today. Welcome back to the Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Maya Spalter. Maya, we were talking about your book, Enchantments, and let me read the whole title. Enchantments, A Modern Witch's Guide to Self-Possession. What does that mean to you, self-possession? I heard something once working at Enchantments. It was sort of a question about why do witches wear black? And somebody, it was a non-joke answer, (laughs) somebody um, said that witches wear black because black is the color of clergy and that any witch is their own priest or priestess because being a witch means not needing an intermediary between yourself and the divine, Mm -hmm. which I always thought that it was like, that's why. That's why I'm, I'm interested in this as a label if I'm going to have one for my spiritual life was because I was like, yeah, exactly. I'm just as good a conduit <laughs> between like the earth and the divine as anything else. So I don't know if that's exactly answering what you asked. But, it is. Yeah. And just to drill down a little bit, it doesn't sound to me like you mean literally we always have to wear black because I mean, oh, yeah, you're no, wearing but, an awesome no. denim jumpsuit today. <laughs> you have yeah. an orange flower in your hair. Yeah, no, like, I love wearing color. It's just that Being self-possessed in terms of like just a characteristic of how you behave, just being in charge of yourself. That's like one of the um, adjectives I would love to have people use to describe me if I could say what sort of impression have I left on a room. The phrase of self-possessed. Yeah. Yeah. But also being consumed with a spirit and having it be the spirit that's native to you. I love that because that word possession is often used in regard to being possessed by a ghost or a spirit or a poltergeist, some sort of external entity. But the idea of being possessed by your own spirit is so beautiful and so evocative. I really love that, Maya. Thanks. And now in your book, and I don't mean this in a trivial or trivializing way, but you go through kind of the 101 of like, hey you're interested in witchcraft, here's what you can do. Here's what an altar is and how you can make one. You go through color magic, candles, herbs, sigils, planets, holy days, and some specific spells too. So it's a really great primer for what we might call the baby witch or the newbie witch. And yet I will say as someone who's been a practitioner for a long time, I learned so much from your book and was so inspired to incorporate a lot of new techniques into my own practice. So 
you really struck this very difficult to do a balance between, I think, being a great intro kind of guide and also giving something new to people who've been doing this for a long time. So really well done. Thanks. But I wanted to also talk about your voice throughout the book because you're really fucking funny <laughs> and really warm and you don't take this shit too seriously, which I'm always very attracted to when it comes to the people I gravitate towards to learn from. You have this spirit of playfulness and longtime listeners know that I use the phrase reverent irreverence all the damn time. But like you are a queen of reverent <laughs> irreverence. What made you want to carry that energy of playfulness throughout this book? It's completely necessary. Since we're talking about planetary energies, I write from a mercurial place and I really want to make you laugh. That's something I really realized in this process was like, oh man, like there's a little vaudevillian inside of me <laughs> who <laughs> is just like hitting you with their elbow and rim shots. I'm just trying so hard to keep us all entertained. Something I learned and some other jobs was learn to recognize when the light goes out in someone's eyes when you're talking to them. It is the thing I fear the most <laughs> in my life. And so I was writing as if to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're like in the best possible way, really fucking silly. Like you come <laughs> up with, um, you're talking about rainbow magic and you're talking about Roy G. Biv DeVoe, which made me laugh. And one of my favorite things that you brought up is talking about the holy days. And you say you've coined your own holiday, which you call Dia de los Dresses. Can you tell us what that holy day is, please, Maya? Oh, my goodness. I think it happened just a couple days ago. Yes. Um, it is the first day in the tri-state area where um, it is warm enough to have bare legs, to wear a brightly colored dress or outfit, and wander around the streets, and you eat outside, and everybody just gets to sort of unclench their shoulders and put away their hideous coats. Yes. It's the Hanami in New York. It's Hanami is the cherry blossoms, exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's it's big selfie season. It it usually coincides with tulips, magnolias. Beautiful. And do you also celebrate this with any kind of candles and such? Or candles is it more just you like wandering outside in a beautiful dress and yeah, making it's yourself a beauty, giggle? It's a beauty ritual for sure. Um Man, it like gets very heavy celebration wise for me. Like this weekend, there's a lot of lot of holidays: Passover and then Easter, mm -hmm. and then it gets really hard to fit <laughs> so many holidays. I really I, it makes my head spin in the spring. I've like I've celebrated this New Year like. Eight times this year. Yeah, Beltane's coming going. up. Well, by the time this episode airs, all of these holy days will have happened already. Well, you've added another one on my wheel, so I'm going to be looking out for Dia de los Dresses for sure. <laughs> that said, you also incorporate a lot of history, some science. I learned so much about the planets that I never Ooh. knew. It was really, really educational for me. But I appreciated you nodding to people like, Austin Osman Spare when you're writing about sigil magic or talking about in New York City witch history, name checking the shop Magical Child, which for those listeners who aren't familiar with it, this was a really iconic shop that existed in the 1970s, if I'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly, and was a real hub of occult culture, a culture, mm -hmm. and also queer culture too, and subculture. So I really, really appreciated that. And one other person you talk about a lot is Grant Morrison. And I would love to hear you expand a little bit on why you like Grant Morrison and what you've learned from him. So for people who don't know who he is, um, I know he's a comic book writer, of course. Right. Yeah. He's a Scottish comic book author. And Something really particularly compelling to me and relevant about Grant Morrison's work for me was that he did this speech. I don't even remember what it was for, but I found it on YouTube. He just kind of runs through the basics of how to do sigil magic, which 
It was very new to me. I hadn't really heard of it before, but hearing about it in his voice, which is hilarious and filthy and um, really casual and not taking things too seriously at all. I was inspired to make sigils, obviously, but also really inspired to talk to people about witchcraft and magic that way. Mm -hmm. So that was really essential to me. And when I heard him go through this, he was referring to it as pop magic. And it's also referred to as chaos magic. But when you say chaos magic, people think you love demons <laughs> and blood. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, mm, not exactly. Pop magic seems a little bit like a more direct and relevant way for me to conceptualize it. And as a comic book author, when Grant Morrison talks about pop magic and when he talks about different energies and deities and pantheons, he had this concept that superheroes are modern pop incarnation of other pantheons of gods and that they're just as useful to us and our modern selves as they might have been in other polytheistic societies, the archetypes that we can use to break down ourselves and other people and just find ways to understand them better and also find ways to access and use those energies to eventually reach some sort of balance. Yeah, yeah. So it was really freeing for me to interact with those concepts. It was also really interesting for me to see the ways that he used them in his fictional work and his comics, but also how his comics acted as sigils, how he was enacting his magic through his art, through his literature, and living a meta life mm -hmm. that way. I just find that so, so fascinating. And also just the fact that he was able to express it in a way that wasn't utterly alienating. Totally. I am most familiar with his comic book series, The Invisibles. Yeah. And I remember reading stories about how when he was working on The Invisibles, things that would happen to certain characters he was writing would then happen to him in his real life, like the character King Mob. I know he had like a very specific occult link to. And, and I mean, King Mob is also in his very image. Like, exactly. Yeah. They, they look alike. That's right. And this idea that this artistic deity or artistic protagonist or anti-hero that he had created was really affecting his life. And I think King Mob gets sick at one point mm -hmm. in The Invisibles and Grant Morrison literally got sick maybe shortly thereafter or during the writing of it. I'm, I'm forgetting the exact story. And so I think that's really fascinating too, the link between art and magic and the psyche and the things that we make in our sigils and symbols and signs. Yeah. I mean, the, the making of a thing is what like ties together a lot of witchcraft. I guess there are like intangible paths where you don't actually craft a thing, but I find it really fascinating that to do spells, you have to make something. Mm -hmm. And that word craft, I yeah. mean, that's a really specific word that means so many different things, both in art and in witchcraft as well. Yeah. So your book also interweaves different modalities and spiritual systems. What is your own spiritual background? Were you raised with any kind of magic or religion or spiritual system? Yes. So my folks come from uh, very spiritual backgrounds. I suppose my dad's side of the family, they are Jewish, but patrilineally. So, and they're also um, Sicilians, but they weren't raised in any Catholic tradition, but with a lot of Catholic traditions, I'm sure, that, you know, are in the home, but not going to church. But they were raised Jewish, although people quibble about whether you're Jewish if your mom's not. Mm -hmm. I don't worry about that. On um, my mom's side, she went to Catholic school, but was never a believer in that system. Mom's a very spiritual person, but doesn't have a particular home for it. They were very clear when I was a kid that they were like, well, you're going to need some sort of spiritual thing. I used to think they meant everyone. For some reason, I think they just meant me. <laughs> but they're like, you're going to need something. And they sent me to ethical culture, Sunday school, maybe four times. Was that here in the city? <laughs> um, no, it was in Westchester. 
And then I went to like a million bar mitzvahs. We celebrated so many holidays, not all of the Jewish holidays, quite a few holidays, um, <laughs> the major ones, yeah. Christmas and Easter. And so I just always felt that I had access mm -hmm. to uh, whatever spirituality I wanted. I didn't feel like I had to choose mm -hmm. ever. And so I was always very comfortable melding traditions and from a mixed race household. So bothness doesn't mean conflict to me, I guess. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of bothness. And I think that's so relevant when it comes to witchcraft and magic in general. You know, this idea that not everything is just like light and sunshine and summertime. We also have, you know, the opposite of that too. And I think the integration of that is such a key part of magic. So it's really powerful that you got that lesson at such an early age and as part of your identity too. Yeah, I didn't have much to compare it to. So I'm still realizing Maybe it's not as usual as I think to be comfortable holding multiple truths, mm -hmm. but collectively we're learning more and gaining more language for the necessity of doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when did you discover witchcraft? There's so many things that count that way. Like I think I just never stopped being the sort of mystical that children are. So I don't really feel like I discovered it, it always seemed very natural. I had intimate access to plants and flowers, I guess, working at a nursery and greenhouse when I was growing up. So I was always intimate and familiar with that. Always fascinated by animals and wanting to be with them and communicate in that way. And I should say that as Maya's talking, one of our cats, Albie, just came and sat on her lap. Mm. So <laughs> he, he knew you were going to talk he about was animals. Say something about the animals. Yeah. So if you're hearing slate purring right now, that's why. <laughs> but I remember meditating as a little kid just because I could get my legs into the lotus position because I was a little kid <laughs> and being convinced that it was something. It was something more than nothing. I knew that there was an experience beyond tangible experience. So I was able to recognize it when I went on to continue to see it constantly everywhere. Yeah, it's a lucky way to be. We're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. You probably already know about Vera Meat, the whimsical and wonderful jewelry and fashion line that's been a supporter of the Witch Wave for a long time. So you'll be as excited as I am to find out that Vera Meat has a new podcast. Vera is not only a business owner and accessories designer, she's a witchy medium herself. And on her podcast, she'll be speaking with her most inspiring friends, like iconic Gucci model Unia, The Voice season 13 winner Chloe, and Amy, a creatureologist who draws and tells the history of different magical creatures. You can find the Vera Meat podcast on iTunes, and that's spelled Vera M-E-A-T, like the food. And you can find out what Vera's up to by following her at Vera Meat on Instagram. So go ahead and listen to the Vera Meat podcast today. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Maya Spalter. So Maya, as I was saying earlier, your book is great for both newbie witches and for more established witches, but I would love some suggestions that you might be able to give listeners who are just starting out. Let's start with those guys. If someone were to come to you in addition to you saying, buy my book and read it, which they absolutely should, what do you usually tell people? Maybe they don't have a specific thing they want. They just want to be more quote unquote witchy. They want to start having some kind of witchcraft practice. Where do they begin? I think one of my favorite things to do is, I guess somebody called it like doing the elements. Uh, this is something that I teach my friends and that I do when somebody moves into a new place or when my house feels funky. Pick a spot. If you don't have an altar, that's always your altar. You pick a spot. Kitchen counter works great. And then I like to do earth, air, fire, water, spirit. Those are the elements that we're doing. So I find a way to represent each. Water is usually just water. Earth is usually salt or maybe it's dirt, but salt's a little for what we're going to do with it. Salt incense for air because you can see it and a candle for fire 
And then spirit can be whatever you want. It could be nothing. And then what I do is I make circuits with these elements. So we'll start at the starting point and sprinkle water around the perimeter of my space, which is usually my apartment. But hey, maybe you're in a field at midnight with the moon. You make the circle with the water. Same thing with the salt. Do the same thing with the smoke. The same thing with the fire. By now, you'll be dizzy, having gone around in circles, being very attentive to the boundaries of your sacred space. Doing that circuit is my way of casting a circle as a solitary witch. And I don't have a the poems that a lot of people, Wiccans would read to cast a circle. You know, I don't say we call upon the spirits of this or that. I usually use pop music that matches the mood of my intention. And I pay a lot of attention to that. Lyrics mean a lot to me. So I find incantations, but I find them. I don't usually make my own. And that is a practice that can be the beginning or all of a ritual that you do. And it takes a while and it's a lot of time that you get to spend with your intention. And I always feel different when I'm done with it. I love that. So I have follow-up questions. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine what somebody who's hearing this for the first time might want to know. Yeah. So first of all, is there a certain order that you recommend for the elements? Because I know the order I was taught to call circle, mm-hmm. but I also know that that varies and people call circle in different order. They, you know, have different ways of calling in the directions or the elements. So do you always start with water or do you switch it up sometimes? I definitely switch it up. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a good reason why. <laughs> That's okay. So yeah. you're following your instinct. And when you're playing this music, is it during when you're walking around or is it after? Do you cast the circle first and then play the music? I play the music the whole time, I suppose. I do things differently every time. I guess with the, the reverent irreverence, I don't even want to follow my own rules. <laughs> But the ritual itself is paying as much attention as possible to whoever is directing this ritual, whatever notion in me is directing this ritual. I try to recede so that I can relax into whatever it is that wants to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the casting of circles is sort of for. It's like, I'm going to make enough space to be filled with Something, it's not that it's necessarily outside of yourself, but it's something that's outside of your ego and your intellect and your planning mind. And that's really what I find useful about the improvisation is that my planning mind gets to relax. I'm not looking at my phone and reading some poem somebody wrote 70 years ago. Yes, yes. And this ritual, it sounds to me like someone could use it simply if they just want to be more receptive to whatever spiritual messages or feelings that might come through. But perhaps it could be a good way of setting the stage for them doing an actual spell or trying to manifest something. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I think it's an invocation or it could also be the end. It could also be an opening ritual, a closing ritual. You can do it once, do something in between, do it again. It's a way of marking the time, marking the space Mm -hmm. and what you want to do with that time and space. It could be elaborate or you could just take a nap in that time and space. And maybe that's what you need. I could definitely use a magical nap. I, it sounded sure. really good to me when I said it. I was like, oh man, maybe yes, we can do Yes, yes. So in terms of using pop music, that's something I really appreciate you mentioning because I do that sometimes oh, too. Do I'm so interested mm-hmm. to hear what songs people use for spells. Oh yeah. A really powerful one for me is the song Pluto by Bjork. Do you know that oh, song? I don't know. What, wait, is it, which album is it on? It's off of, I want to say Vespertine. Yeah. But I might have to double check myself. It's oh, the I'll one check. that goes, excuse me, while I explode oh my, my, God, that's my body off. And it's yeah. a really driving beat. And it's very electro. I don't actually usually listen to like hard kind of industrial or electro music that yeah. often. But it's this really driving beat. And I love the lyrics of it. And it just makes me feel like I'm turning into something else. It's a really great like let go of something that's not serving you anymore. So you can become something oh bigger and better. It's I'm, really this powerful. This is what I'm going to do later. I'm so excited. <laughs> that's a really good one. Yeah. I want to do a spell like that. What's a song or two that you might gravitate towards that comes to mind there's maybe one of the most appropriate ones 
I did a spell many years ago to find a new place to live. And I wanted it to just be kind of like my real home home, not my until something better comes along kind of place. So I was doing a spell for that. And um, the song I chose was Mushaboom, that Feist song. Mm -hmm. It's It's a very cozy song. It's a cozy song. (laughs) I found the cutest place and like talked to the neighbors and tipped my cap a little home barely on the map. It's like, it's there. I mean, it's still in Brooklyn, but like, it's really, it really came. Also, there's lines in there about like helping the kids with their coat or something. Oh, wait, we don't have kids yet. You know, sort of like the thing about this song. It was like, oh yeah, like it's definitely that. Every single little bit of it. And it also has this wonderful chanting that happens at the end of it. And it's like echoes and overlaps and it makes it so it's a really appropriate song for for playing on a loop. Mm -hmm. So it can go on for a long time and make that spinning, revolving sensation that helps you elevate your intention, makes things less mundane. That one worked out really, really nicely. Wonderful. So you got an apartment and yeah. you have a child. Yes. And the, and the child <laughs> to egg, put the tiny coat on. Well, the full, yeah. It's just, you know, the song is like a confection of a fantasy of domestic life. But one that actually appealed to me, there's plenty of songs that are like that. But one that like, oh, yeah, that sounds like the right flavor of it. And it did all come to pass. It was pretty great. That's wonderful. So you've worked in the retail slash service magician side of things on and off for a long time at Enchantments. And I imagine things have changed since you began working there. Was it in the 90s? Mm, Yeah, it was like 2000. Okay, Mm. the year 2000. I'm curious, first of all, how things have changed. I know witchcraft goes in and out of quote unquote trendiness and it has for many, many decades, Mm -hmm. you know, the latest kind of witch wave, Yeah, (laughs) there you go, is only one of many that have happened over several decades. So I'm curious, does it feel like things are different? Are you guys busier now than you were in the year 2000? Yes, absolutely. I think we're much busier. Also, you know, we have a much further reach on the internet, not that we're even like super gangbusters as a online retailer. It's just easier for people to know. Yeah. And also, I think it's easier for people to care about these things without being dismissed Mm -hmm. entirely, although that happens all the time. Mm. But I think it's socially more acceptable to um, be seen going in and out of some sort of a cult shop. That was a weird thing. You had to... Be um, committed to counterculture to find yourself in there. Yeah. Back then. So there's a little less stigma now, it sounds there's, like. Yeah, there's less stigma, but also to balance that almost is that I guess maybe there's less of a community. Mm-hmm. It's less of a clubhouse mm-hmm. for better and for worse, for sure. Mm-hmm. And then finally, on that note, a lot of witches or witch adjacent people are thinking a lot about how to be a witch with ethics and morals. And some might argue that's the only way to be a witch. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, and I realize you don't own enchantments, you know, you're not like it's official spokesperson, (laughs) but do you have thoughts around how to ethically sell magical goods and services. Because, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff out there that might be a little bit questionable when it comes to how it may be taking advantage of people or how it is capitalizing on capitalism Mm -hmm. in gross ways. Like, how do you feel about the topic of people paying for magic? Right. Well, and enchantment. So the way we deal with that line is that we don't enact rituals for people. The idea is that we give them all of the tools and supplies they might need, but that the spell itself is powered by intention and you're not paying us for our intentions. And people do ask often. So in that way, it doesn't feel very complicated because I'm not responsible for the outcome of what anybody does because I I have a very clear boundary about the fact that they're doing it and that I'm selling them wax and oil and plant matter Mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. In that way, in terms of the moral implications of what people choose to do, that's pretty simple from our retail environment. Although we do 
depending on the energy level and depending on how people ask, we do take a position of recommending that people not do manipulative magic. Mm -hmm. Meaning control over other people exactly for good or for ill. Yeah, just for what you want. So yeah, we do recommend against that. And we do like kind of take a stand. But in the end, it's like, oh, you want this? Take this. Mm -hmm. Great. It would be very dangerous to deeply concern myself with that. But I want to get to all the different points of your question, though. Philosophically in the store, how do we deal with the morality of what other people do? I feel like I got that part. Yeah. And what about just, there are some people who say that we shouldn't be charging money for spiritual services at all. Right. I mean, those people must have other ways of making their living, for (laughs) sure. I don't really know where that concept comes from or why people cling to it. I think they think because, like money is is dirty and it's material. And and I think the theory goes, you know, what you guys are doing is this rarefied service and you shouldn't be profiting off yeah. of people. You could only think it. it's rarefied if you're not in there because it's just, it's very earthly. It's just very, <laughs> very earthly, the things that we're doing in there. But also that's a lovely, lovely concept, but who's feeding these people? Mm-hmm. You can definitely apply that if you're in a society where we care for each other and value skills equally and stuff. If my like ability to help people realize their intention or build their spiritual practice was so valuable to society that groceries would just like come to my house or, <laughs> or that like it would be free to live in New York City because of this wonderful service that I provide, then that would be great. But that's not at all what we're working with. So yeah, and it's labor, it's work, we're on our feet, we're tired. Yeah, we do things. So you're making things. Yeah, you're buying things from other places. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We're like supporting other businesses in the city and doing all of that. So yeah, no, I don't I don't have qualms about making money working in a shop in that way. You know, I mean, I have issues with capitalism. Sure. (laughs) Like, definitely. (laughs) Um, But in terms of, like, there are some things that, like, sweetgrass, for example, I didn't know this until recently, but where it comes from, it's not meant to be bought and sold. Mm -hmm. Specifically that one. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that, like, all plants aren't. Yeah. We've talked on the show quite a bit about white sage and how, you know, a lot of folks are saying that, first of all, it's such a sacred plant to indigenous people and certainly not to call it a smudge anymore, that the word smudge is a very specific term that indigenous people are using to be specific about their rituals and traditions and to call it an herb bundle or to call it Mm -hmm. cleansing with smoke instead of smudging. But also just the idea of like, if it's going to be sourced, to source it from an actual indigenous people as opposed to whatever retailer. I mean, I don't know yeah. where the enchantments line is on that, and right. I don't expect you to oh, yeah, no, speak for them. Exactly. But. Well, I'm happy to because I think um, I know the owner of the shop personally. She doesn't like sage. She doesn't use sage, but we sell sage. Mm-hmm. We sell white sage. People ask me sometimes where it comes from, and I'm like, mm. they're like, but is it the good place? And I'm like, mm, probably not. I don't know. We never really used to sell Palo Santo, and now we do. But I was always like, well, what happened to that tree? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot of people. That's over a lot of people with now. a little chunk of this rainforest tree in their bathroom. But what I do find interesting in terms of like uh, the commodification of these ritual plants and herbs is that I know that white sage is a sacred plant. I didn't know in terms of sustainability Mm -hmm. and it hadn't entered my consciousness until it was a problem, Mm -hmm. until the Sephora incident. But what I found so heartening about that was that that process was so quick from a problem to people being really clear about where they stand and what else that you can do about it. And then also how effective it was. Yeah. And just for people who don't know what we're talking about, Sephora was going to sell a witch kit that was created by a company called Pinrose. And it was supposed to have perfume and tarot and a bundle of white sage in it. And uh, I think they called it a starter witch kit. And there, you know, people for many different reasons were up at arms about this. And Sephora decided not to continue with this company or not to at least sell this kit. Over the course of a few days, Mm -hmm. it went from like, oh, goody for us, look what we're doing to, oh, we had no idea and we're not going to do it anymore. And in the meantime, so many people who want to make responsible choices 
got the information that they needed in order to be able to make those responsible choices about where they get their supplies from and also to just begin to think about it. Yeah, to Um, be more mindful and to educate yourself. And I think to also... I think people sometimes feel very judged if they've been doing something and then someone tries to correct them. But I've done it. I've changed some of my consumption behavior and some of my language. And it's okay. Like, I didn't know before. And now we know. And so we do better. It's so wonderful. And also to, you know, cultivate a culture of being able to do that, that because you burned a bundle of white sage and called it a smudge stick. Uh, That doesn't mean you're terrible. Refusing to change when you get great reasons to do so isn't so great. So the other day, my friend, I was over her house. She had bought this sage she was going to stick inside of a chicken, like just regular cooking sage. But she hadn't made the chicken. The sage had started to dry on her counter. And I got some twine and I tied it up and I burned it. And I don't see why you can't just get your sage at the grocery store. And is that a problem? <laughs> like it was great. Yeah, it was great. If you yeah. want to burn some, you, they have it at the gro- at the grocery store. Yeah, like they have almost all of your other magical supplies. Well, yeah, and I mean it's certainly a different kind of sage than the white ceremonial sage. Honestly, but I think though, to your would point, you, I well, yeah, it's a yeah. different kind, but it's good that it's a different kind because yeah. this is the kind that's not. You can grow that on your windowsill if you want. Honestly. I couldn't tell the difference. (laughs) (laughs) Using what you have. Well, Maya, you have been very generous with your time. Once more, for the people in the back, your book is Enchantments, A Modern Witch's Guide to Self-Possession. It is so wonderful. I always ask my guests, how can people find you? How can people find more about what you do? Well, you can find me on the Instagram that's really the easiest way. I'm on Twitter at MYA, but I swear I don't say anything. <laughs> I really don't. But you can come be my friend. Maybe I'll say something if you want to talk to me. That'd what's, be fun. What's your Instagram handle? It is Maya.spalter, M Y A. S-P-A-L-T-E-R. Wonderful. And I'm going to do a plug for both of us. So when my book, Waking the Witch, comes out on June 4th, I am hosting a conversation between three of my favorite witch writers at McNally Jackson Books in Williamsburg. That's on the evening of June 4th. It's on my website, pamgrossman.com. And I'm bringing this up because Maya is one of those three witch writers. So it'll be Maya Spalter, the poet Dorothea Lasky, and Kristen Soleil, the author of Witches, Sluts, Feminists, and a friend of the show who's been on the show. So it's going to be a really good time of witches and writers and all kinds of other magical shenanigans. So please join us. And Maya, I can't wait to see you there. I can't wait. It's going to be excellent. Hooray. Thank you so much for being here, Maya. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Maya Spalter for her magical pragmatism and playfulness. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop me an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the witch wire. The Witch Wave is produced and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs. Thank you, Rachel, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman and Chiquita Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website, witchwavespodcast.com. And please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchwavePod. And you can check out my Witch Emoji for iPhone by going to WitchEmoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. And please consider pre-ordering my book. Waking the Witch, which is out on June 4th of this year. So soon! I've also got a ton of events and appearances coming up, which you can find out about by going to pamgrossman.com slash events. 
Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.